Okay, so next you're going to ask students to do steps 9 through 11. All right, and so in number 9 it says to look back at the results of their, um, their fruit fly experiment and look at that some of the some of the populations maxed out sooner than other populations. Okay, and they're going to think about that. They don't have to write anything for number 9. But number 10 has them think about how did you know how many babies when you were when you were doing the expected numbers? How did you know how many babies to add with each generation? Well, what did they do? They took the R, number of babies, and they multiplied it by their N. Okay? And that gives you number of babies. Okay? And a fancy way to write number of babies is the change in the population size over the change in time. Okay? Which actually is number of babies. Okay? So, that is the way to write it. That, that if you want to know the number of babies, you just take R times N. Now, some students like to write the actual equation out, and it would be, you know, the, the population size at time T would be your initial population size, NI, plus the number of babies, RN. Okay? Either equation is fine. Um, this is the exponential growth equation. But you're going to let students come up with, for number 10, they're going to come up with their own equations. Have them write them on their whiteboards. Have them share them around the class. What did you come up with? What did you come up with? And discuss the differences between the equations. Uh, but ultimately, you want to make sure that they get to this, that the number of babies is R times N. So if you want to know the next generation, you take the initial generation and you add R times N, the number of babies. Okay, and then it asks them, um, in number 11, to use their fourth generation of whatever they had and do this. Remember, this is how we did it, the number of babies added over the initial population size. They're calculating the R for each of their four different jars, the vestigial flies, the normal flies, the big jars, the little jars. Um, and they're going to calculate the rate. Everyone's rate's going to be a little bit different depending on the fly, the genetics of the fly, the type of the fly. I have no idea what patterns you're going to see. There's no, um, I mean, obviously smaller jars uh, will max out faster than, than larger jars. Uh, but as far as vestigial and normal, there doesn't seem to be a pattern. But, but ask the students and have them share out their R's, excuse me, for their four populations and see if you come up with some kind of pattern that everybody who had vestigial flies have a larger R than, than everybody who didn't. They come from the same stock population, so it could be a genetic thing. Um, but at the beginning of that section of 9 through 11, it asks them if they think that this is a sustainable population growth. And they should be thinking about that. Do you think that this that, that population growth that we saw, which should look like this, is it sustainable? Right? Can you see that? Yeah. Is it sustainable? Um, and, and obviously it's not because their populations died. For on so for on number twelve, they're going to plot their expected numbers, so the ones that they calculated here, and then they're gonna plot their four different jars, their jar and their three teammates' jars. So they're gonna end up with some kind of graph. Um, that looks like, let's see, I'm going to draw it in black. They should have the expected numbers. Ooh, that's a terrible black marker. Let me get a better one just a second. Okay, they'll have their expected numbers like this, and then they'll have all their different populations. So they'll have, you know, their jar that did this and this, and their neighbor's jar that did this and this and their other person that did this and then this, whatever, okay? And so they're going to have a bunch of different different um, graphs. And so it says, if you're, um, did your observed values, what you actually saw, match our prediction? And the answer is no. And the question is, why not? And so at the end of 12, you should have a discussion about limiting factors. Okay, so limiting factors are things that are going to limit the population size. And they could be things like, I'm going to erase this, limiting factors and have them start listing limiting factors like food, available food, available space, the buildup of waste products, disease, okay? But you can also have things like volcanoes or climate change or any number of other things that could cause the, the limit to the population size. And so these types of things are density dependent Meaning that they play more of a role. Wow, they play more of a role in limiting the population the larger the density gets. Whereas these kinds of things are density independent. It doesn't matter how big the population size is; they're just going to limit it. 
So in the case of our fly populations, it's most likely a density dependent thing that's happening, like lack of food, lack of space, buildup of waste, maybe disease, um, but mostly it's the food, space, and waste, okay? And then you're also going to point out and have everybody draw their graph for their group, the graph of four, on their whiteboards, and then have them show their whiteboards and see if you can figure out what is the capacity of that environment. For each of the different ones, there is a capacity at which they couldn't grow anymore, okay? And then shortly after which, the population crashed, okay? And so we call this the carrying capacity. It's the carrying capacity of the environment. And it's going to be different for everybody's jar. And it's probably going to be different with, throughout the group. So I would have them share. My carrying capacity was 200 flies. My carrying capacity was 75 flies. My carrying capacity was 500 flies. Okay? And so carrying capacity. Make sure you cover that right there. All right? Okay, so I'm going to stop it and go to the next section.